Good morning and welcome to Inner West Council Library. We present an HSC lecture series in partnership with First Class Tutoring. But before all, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodian of the land on which we produce this series, the Gadigal and Wangal people of the Eora Nation and show my respect to the elders past, present and emerging, and to all First Australian watching this series with us. Enjoy and good luck for your exam after a very, very hard year. Welcome to the HSC lecture series. This particular video will look at HSC business studies and how to best prepare for that exam. There's two videos in the series. This video, video one, will look at the structure of the business studies exam, how to best perform in the business studies exam, and we'll look at ways to revise different types of study methods, memory techniques, and how to address the glossary terms that are given in questions in the exam. Then finally, there will be some resource help on how to access uh, resources to help you with your study. Video two in the series will look specifically at exam technique. So the four sections of the exam, the multiple choice, short answers, report and case study. Uh, we'll look at breaking down each section, what are typical uh, questions in those sections from past exams, little uh, tricks in how to answer those questions and how to best prepare for them. This video will also look at sample answers and feedback from uh, Nessa and the marking centres of how students went and what the strengths of answers were by students and what some of the areas that students would need to improve upon. So let's get started. The HSC is a marathon and you are halfway through that marathon. And like any marathon, uh, the best approach would be for you to prepare well and to have a steady and consistent approach. And then we sort of build up towards that final HSE exam with a big finish, hopefully. So at the moment you're in term two and you've probably just come back to school for face-to-face -face teaching. And in this time of term two, you would be obviously completing your coursework and looking at assessments. So some of you might have upcoming assessments. So the focus would be around doing well in those assessments and understanding and getting through the course content. Term three, you're building up towards your trial HSE exams, and this is a major part of your assessment. And then once that's done, we move into term four and in preparation for the HSE exam. And just last week, it was announced that uh, the HSE exam will be put back by five days. So there, there's an extra uh, period of time that you're able to prepare for these exams. So the idea is you're consistently building towards that finish and you're taking care of assessment tasks and learning coursework as you go. All right, the HSE Business Studies exam has four main topics. Operations, financial management, marketing and human resource management. Each of those sections are equally treated and there will be questions from each of those sections in the HSC exam. The next thing that you need to consider when preparing for the HSC exam is the syllabus. And what you have in front of you there are the learn to components of the syllabus. Now, I know lots of students prepare really well on the syllabus, but only looking at the learn about. So this comes at the top of the syllabus after the outcomes, and these are areas that students or questions that students should be able to do. So if we look at the first one there, it says describe the features of operations management for businesses in, tertiary, in a tertiary industry. So this potentially could be a question as it, um, as it appears here or different variations of it. We look at the second one, assess the relationship between operations and the other key business functions into actual businesses. You'll see when we look at video two and past paper questions, this um, notion of the relationship between areas of the course within a topic has been tested in the last few years. And in particular, this dot point 
looks at this notion of interdependence, which is a major part of the course that students should be preparing uh, well on. Our last two dot points you can see are around the strategies. So in each of the topics, the advice is you would need to prepare well on the strategies for each of the topics. This one here is asking how operation strategies, so things like outsourcing, total quality management, would help a business to sustain its competitive advantage. So it's a, it's a specific uh, look at strategies linked to this notion of, you know, what is your business doing better than similar businesses? And finally, again, this recommendation of strategies. And we'll have a look at these glossary verbs a little bit later in the video, but uh, that's a higher order verb where you're giving reasons um, for potential strategies um, in a business. All right, let's move on. The finance topic, there are four learn to um, components here. You must be able to calculate financial ratios. So that's a, that's a given and, and these questions pop up all the time in uh, multiple choice and short answer. Um, the next one's looking at how the performance can be assessed using comparative ratio analysis. So that means, are you able to compare uh, financial data between years, say 2017, 2018? Are you able to compare uh, between different businesses? And the one that seems to come up uh, more regular than the others is comparing against a standard or an industry average. The next uh, point there is recommending strategies to improve financial performance. So again, knowing your financial strategies well um, is a key component. And again, being able to recommend, it's going beyond just saying what the strategy is, but giving reasons for using that strategy in that particular context. And then we've got the ethical component and ethical uh, reporting of uh, financial uh, data. Our final topic is uh, human resources, and there's four learn to components here. The first one starts with the important interdependence. You know, I always say to students, you should know really well how the different topics connect to each other, and being explicit and detailed on that would be very good preparation. In terms of um, what you would need to know in interdependence, you know, you could potentially be asked a case study 20 mark question um, on interdependence. Uh, there was one in recent times in the business report, but this could be an area that you could potentially have to write a whole case study response to interdependence. The second point there is about negotiating enterprise and collective agreements. So when you get to the HR topic, there's a whole section about disputes and industrial disputes within um, the workplace and within business, and then how to uh, resolve those disputes. Advantages and disadvantages of outsourcing. So this is another connection to operations, that outsourcing is a strategy in operations, but it's also um, under the role of human resource management and this whole notion of accessing workers from overseas. And finally, um, recommending appropriate strategies in HR. The HR topic is the only one that has effectiveness criteria attached to it. So that's things like absenteeism, staff turnover, level of disputation. When you learn that, the good thing about that section of the course is that that helps you to evaluate. Because evaluate means to make a judgment and using those syllabus points, you are then able to use that to help you evaluate with the use of criteria. And that obviously would be the criteria. All right, so you would know by now that there's a repetitive structure to the HSC course. And the word RIPS refers to the four components that are in every single topic. So as you can see here under operations, We'll look at the role, the influences, the processes, and the strategies. So I guess it's been designed that way to help students uh, remember um, aspects of the course and place those under the specific topics there. 
the only um, exception uh, there would be, and I'll just move this out of the way, is the effectiveness component that goes with HR. And I've just um, <clears throat> mentioned that, but you can see that each topic has the four areas and HR has the additional area there. All right, let's move on. The format of the HSE exam. Okay, so you should know that the HSE exam is broken into four sections. Section one, 20 multiple choice questions there, worth 20 marks. And the timing of the 35 minutes is just a mathematical calculation of 1.8 minutes per mark. So if you look at it uh, in a way that the exam is out of 100, this section is out of 20, you should spend about one um, fifth of the time and that's the 35 minutes. However, as we know, <clears throat> and when we look at the next video, we'll look at the ways of getting through the multiple choice a little bit quicker and therefore you can save a little bit of time in this section. But the advice is not to rush and, and make mistakes because at the end of the day, this whole section is worth the equivalent of the case study that appears in section four. Section two of the paper is our short answer questions, totaling 40 marks. Now it's got here, you could get four to six short answer questions. So the four would typically mean one from each topic and the total of each um, question would be 10 marks, okay? But in the last few years, typically they're using five lots of short answer questions. And we're talking about like an A, B, C component there in the short answer. So just be prepared that there's not necessarily four questions, one on each topic. There could be a, a, an extra two sections there. And again, the hour and 15 minutes is calculated because of 40% of the time. And again, work quickly, we'll work efficiently through this section, but you may have some time up your sleeve um, if you're able to answer those questions pretty well and effectively. There's 12 parts approximately in total. All right, the business studies report section three. You must write a report, you must write in report format. It has stimulus material attached to it that you would need to refer to and we'll look at that later on. 20 marks. 35 minutes, most students, if they're saving a bit of time in section one and two, would spend about 40 to 45 minutes in this particular report. The questions can come from any of the four topics. The thing to note here, there will only be two topics tested. So two tested in the report, the two that are not tested would be in the extended response. So for example, if um, the report had a marketing component and a finance component, then the extended response um, would have HR and operations, okay? Approximate length, we're looking at 800 words, okay? Which is roughly six pages of writing. Most important part here, you address all parts to the question that are given and that you're integrating the stimulus material. The extended response, also known as the case study question, 20 marks, and again, you're probably spending around 40 to 45 minutes with a bit of time saved earlier in the paper. Um, as we've mentioned, it's two questions and it comes from two different topics. So you have a choice there of two questions. And again, the approximate length is 800 words. So that's just a, a recap of what I've said in terms of the suggested time allocation. So the advice is, you know, work, um, you know, work uh, efficiently, but don't rush in those first two sections. And you'll have a little bit of time up your sleeve extra for the last two sections. All right, so let's have a look at how to best perform um, in the HSE exam. So the most important part of your revision and preparation is around the syllabus document. I would imagine you've got that document, you've got a copy of that document, and you're constantly looking at that document, referring to it, particularly when you're making notes, etc. Maybe at school when the teacher's going through the, the course, you're highlighting, you're marking off um, that you've done that part of the course. All right, so we're saying to use things like flashcards. 
acronyms, mnemonics, peer testing, uh, rote learning. All right. So the idea here is that you're learning specific parts of the syllabus by using these memory techniques. And we'll have a look at those a little bit later. We've already uh, mentioned the idea about the RIPs in terms of the structure of each topic. And in looking at understanding the interdependence between business functions. So we've already mentioned about that as a part of preparing, um, looking at the glossary of terms that'll come up soon and the whole idea of planning. And in the second video, that video starts with how to use your planning time and how to plan during the uh, first uh, part of the exam. Another way of um, preparing for exams is to practice your paragraph writing. So the idea is instead of um, writing whole reports and case study responses, that you would be um, breaking that down and looking at particular questions and writing a paragraph on that and then seeing whether you're on track on that and, and getting feedback would be pretty important. All right, this next section, we'll look at the, the science of revision. There was a really good article a few years ago, uh, which was written by The Guardian um, in terms of looking at pupils and how to revise more effectively for exams. It was an extensive study uh, done and um, the results found that there's a few areas where students could improve upon and we'll have a look at those now. So number one, the importance of not missing breakfast, particularly going to school. Um, having energy and this notion that your attention span and ability to recall information really does come from um, uh, having breakfast each morning and, and basically having uh, good balanced meals when you are revising. The second one, an obvious one about the phone, um, definitely a distraction. Uh, there is distraction when you're preparing for exams or assessments. The distractions when you're at home just doing your revision and um, and homework so the idea would be to put those away to not have that particular distraction in revision hopefully you've started and you've started preparing for the HSC exam by looking at the revision of the topics that you're studying at the moment and the, the best advice is that you're spreading that over time that you are constantly chipping away at your revision and you're doing more than just the homework that teacher might, the teacher might be giving you, that you're going back and you're revising past content. And you're doing that in small chunks. And the idea is that you're locking that into your long-term memory. Uh, another technique that um, is often used is um, this idea of uh, teaching yourself. Okay, so you're able to, um, I guess, recall information better, and sorry, testing yourself, that is. Um, and that would be looking at quizzes and practice papers um, during your study sessions, etc. And we'll have a little bit more look at that past paper uh, preparation in terms of testing yourself. This is the teaching one, which is another um, aspect of uh, memory and preparing for exams. You know, it, it's a skill to be able to recall information and to teach someone else that information. And, and it definitely does help to lock that information into long-term memory. There was some suggestion about highlighters not being that effective, particularly students that highlighting lots and lots of notes on the page it sort of loses its effect. Um, not sure what you think about uh, number seven in listening to music. But again, the, the, the research is showing that a quiet environment is the best for recall. I know some students think that they probably prepare better by having their headphones on and listening to music, something to consider. Uh, number eight there, getting out and exercising, uh, getting some fresh air, having regular breaks definitely is, is important. And our final one is regular sleep patterns. You know, can't stress how much uh, benefit you will have for your well-being and, and just your ability to focus etc by having um, regular sleep patterns all right so they're sort of general areas for revision but let's have a look at the best methods of study okay so we've broken these down into looking at study notes everybody 
prepare study notes for different topics. It's just the way that you're gonna put those notes together. So business studies, obviously you'll follow your textbook, your notes in class, etc. But one of the things you might consider is putting a little bit of a twist to those notes. A lot of the time the notes are just content driven in terms of descriptions, characteristics, um, learning you know, what the ideas are. And when you do the exam, they're asking you to interpret those notes. So I've seen in the past students actually construct their study notes with things like advantages and disadvantages columns that they've made up themselves. You know, looking at the effect, having the case study integrated into those notes that reinforces what that content is about. Okay, we've mentioned about the syllabus already and um, basically learning and making sure you've covered each part. Uh, this notion of manageable chunks or chunking. Um, so when you're going to revise that these study notes that you have, you might look at specific sections of the syllabus. So say for example, marketing processes, um, you might spend your time just looking at that component and sort of locking that in first, all right? So instead of trying to study large amounts of work, we just focus in on um, doing regular study, uh, smaller parts of the syllabus and, and locking those into our long-term memory. All right, past papers, very important part. You know, every student that I asked, um, you know, after they've done the HSC, that have done really well in the HSC, and I'll, I'll say, what's the, you know, the best method of preparation? And a lot of these things we're doing today, they'll mention, but the number one um, response typically is around past paper revision. And, and that gives you a sense of confidence. You know, if you do lots of revision and you see lots of different questions, when you get into that HSC exam, it's almost like I've seen that question before, it gives you that confidence to answer the question, okay? And we'll look at the technique of, of past papers and, and what the benefit there. Um, another one is to learn the syllabus. There's a syllabus closed passage. You might've seen these around. Uh, teachers create these all the time. So basically by um, removing different components of the syllabus and having you uh, fill those in regularly. And I'll show you a sample, uh, it's coming up. And, and sample answers from the Nessus site. And in video two, lots of different sample answers. You can get access to those. There's different um, HSC Success One books around that have sample answers. There's the Nessus sample answers that the libraries carry and also your schools carry as well. So the sample answers, they're very important for two things. One, to show you the standard of writing. And number two is how to answer the questions. And also, you might also be able to find some additional content, things that you might not have known, and you can add those um, to your notes. All right, so the memory techniques that we're looking at here is mnemonics or acronyms. Now, an acronym is just, you know, taking the first letter of a word and sometimes it makes a word that we might be able to remember. So in the marketing section of the syllabus, marketing processes, the word SMEDI, you know, the first letter stands for a different component of the processes. So situational analysis and marketing, uh, market research, etc. And you would remember that and that would trigger um, to the brain that that acronym relates to a specific uh, content area. We've mentioned about uh, teaching others and um, the benefits of that. Visual guides and posters. Um, I know lots of students have up in their room. They have um, an A3 copy of the syllabus. They might have mind maps of the topic they're studying at the moment. And it's just that, um, you know, subconscious that it's there and that it's helping um, you to remember um, aspects of the, of the course. So with our memory techniques, we've mentioned about the syllabus closed passage and the mnemonics and acronyms. And this is a good way of remembering the syllabus. At the end of the day, like you need to know the syllabus document in detail. So we'll have a look at a bit of a sample now. So this is just a screenshot here of um, the syllabus closed passage I'm talking about. Um, you can do these yourself, like I said, they're around, but basically um, 
you take the syllabus document and you can get it in a word form from Nessa and you can just delete words or part words. And the idea would be that repetitively you would go through and you would just continually work on filling these out. So we look at here, it's marketing processes, section three, situational analysis, and that's broken into a SWOT product life cycle. And then the second component is the market research, establishing marketing objectives, identifying target markets and developing marketing strategies, etc. So you would just, just go through and work on that. Okay. On the right hand side would be your um, acronym or mnemonic. So here we've got our SMEDI. So that matches up. So the idea is you're working away. If you forget, you have a look at um, your acronym or mnemonic that you might have, and then you go back and you complete the syllabus there. All right, um, this is another part, part four, marketing strategies. And again, segmentation, differentiation, you just go through and, and you fill that out. You know, I've been doing this for years and, and students um, find it, you know, the most effective way of revising the syllabus and knowing the sections. Now, this solely is not gonna get you through the HSC, but it provides you with a very good foundation to answering questions. And then with the further study, you're locking in the detail, I guess, of each of these components. Um, over on this side, again, we've got our strategies. Now, you might look at um, seven Ps or PEG. Um, and again, you, you can make up your own acronyms, mnemonics, and I said, there's, there's some around if you search on the internet, there's, there's lots of them around. In terms of mnemonic, so we looked at more acronyms there. Um, this is one that's credited to the Apple uh, case study and your schools might be using those and teachers, but it's a very good publication, um, the Apple case study. And within that, there's some advice around mnemonics. And there's one really good example um, here, and it's uh, referred to as a mnemonic because it take again, it takes the first letter but it puts it into a sentence and sometimes those sentences might not make sense. And probably, you know, if they don't make sense, there's more chance of you remembering it. This is one from operations. So we've got operations influences, and that's the only in Greenland. They quietly chew gum leaves every Christmas. So the idea is that each of these letters is a component of the syllabus. Now there's 17, syllabus sections in total, okay? So that's the four from each topic, which is 16 plus the effectiveness one. So really, these are 17 silly sentences or mnemonics, combination of acronyms, etc., that you can remember. So it's a really important um, memory technique. You can put these on palm cards, revise them, etc. So I'll just show you how it looks. So there's the, um, there's the syllabus operations influences, and then we've got, so the green, only in Greenland, they quietly chew gum leaves every Christmas. Okay, so that's there. And then each of these uh, letters is a, is a syllabus term. Now I like this, and this was done in the uh, Apple uh, case study book. It gives you um, extra words. So I'm a big believer in, if you're gonna learn a key term like globalization, obviously the definition, but what are some other key words that go with it? like global web, like economies of scale, etc. We're looking at technology. So technology is about innovation and, and research and development, etc. Okay. So big believer in keywords um, attached to these main syllabus areas to help you answer questions. So there's an example um, and you might be able to come up with some of those yourself. All right, let's have a look at past papers in a bit of detail, we mentioned this before. So what we're saying here is that you can learn all that content and you could know the syllabus off by heart, but if you don't know how to answer HSE questions and what to expect in those questions, it's really gonna limit the marks that you're gonna receive in the exam, okay? So the idea here is by doing past papers, um, you know, it's the easiest way to find out what you don't know by looking at uh, different questions. It gives you an idea of what marks to expect. So if you're doing a whole paper, for example, and I know you do that in the trial exam, it gives you an indication of how you're traveling. 
And this notion that it takes pressure off exams because it gives you that confidence that you've prepared uh, well. You know, I often hear students say, oh, I've seen that question before. And, and, and they probably have or variations of it because they've done many past papers and they've exposed you know, their learning to uh, different exam papers and questions. All right, so in terms of your um, past paper questions, you know, I'm a big believer in timing it. So it's not like you're just, you're given the past paper and you start doing some questions and then you stop or then you might look things up. No, it's, it's definitely uh, a timed um, event in terms of um, getting a business report, sitting down for 40 minutes and writing that question out and, and completing that question to the best of your ability. All right. The next thing is that you need feedback. So, you know, you need to have strong relationships with your teachers and your teachers will work hard for you, particularly if they can see that you're working hard you know, they'll give you the feedback and the guidance that you need. And from that feedback, you can highlight what areas you might be weak in. So it might be content-based or it might be misreading the questions or not addressing the verb. And then, you know, you can strengthen those weaknesses. Um, I remember a student a few years ago that when I used to comment and give feedback on, um, on, his, um, on his essays, um, sorry, on the reports, um, I would say, well, you haven't really used the stimulus that well and you haven't addressed the verb in this part. And he would write that onto the top of his next report and then making sure that that's conscious for him, that that's where he needs to improve on. So again, it's, it's definitely a way of working out what you need to improve on and what your strengths are. All right, we move on now to the glossary of key terms. And the glossary of key terms are the directive verbs that uh, guide you in how to answer questions in the exam. So I like to look at questions in two parts, okay? So in answering any question, you know, exams are, are trying to work out, you know, what content that you know and how you're gonna apply that content. So what you write and how you write it. So think about that. So the what you write is the content around the question. So the syllabus area and the specific terms and the how you write it is addressing the verb. Okay. So when you're writing a short answer, a report, a, a case study, uh, lots of times you look at the question and students just go in there and start writing. Okay. But you really do need to take note of you know, what specifically are they asking me? What content do I need to address? And how am I gonna use that content? Do I need to justify a strategy? Or do I need to evaluate, okay? So that's pretty important because that's gonna guide you in terms of um, the, you know, the structure of the answer and the way that you're gonna treat or manipulate the content. So understanding the directive verb is very important. So you should be looking at underlining that okay, or highlighting that, or, or writing down. So if you see the word justify, um, you might write above that, oh, that means I need to give reasons and I need to give detailed reasons on why I should use that strategy, for example. Lots of explained questions come up and, and still, you know, students are struggling in making that connection of that cause and effect. So here is a list of the main glossary of key terms for business studies. The list is not exhaustive, but you obviously um, can go to the NASA website and get the full list of those terms there. What's in front of you starts with some lower order verbs. So what we mean by lower order verbs, more sort of knowledge type verbs and comprehension. And we move into higher order verbs. So typically an outline question in a short answer would only be worth a couple of marks. Same with describe and calculate. But once we start moving into the discuss and explain, we're probably looking at more marks because they're mid, um, sort of mid um, term verbs in, in the degree of how you need to answer those. And then we've got the higher order verbs or the higher order skills in analyzing and examining justifying, evaluating, etc. 
Okay, so I can't stress enough, and you know, I'm sure your teachers are working on these with you constantly um, about how to address these verbs in the question. You know, at the end of the day, like a lot of these verbs, when you look at the marking criteria, like for example, if it's an evaluate 20 mark case study question, and you haven't made judgment at all throughout your answer, you're probably not gonna get more than a C um, uh, response there. So if you're gonna access the higher marks um, in your questions for these assess and examine and analyze, et cetera, you really do need to, to do what that verb is asking you to do. Okay, and that's just another outline of some of those. There's just a little bit more detail on some of those verbs there. So you can pause this later on and have a look at those and make sure you um, know those. What's been happening um, as well is the directive verbs are not the only words that uh, they're using in exams. And you might see words like how and how can, or why, you know, why does this happen? Okay, so just be prepared for these um, non-traditional directive terms as well. Here's an example of the how can. So what how can uh, different sources of funds help a business achieve its financial objectives? So that's from the 2002 HSC. So you're looking at it and saying, okay, how? That means to show, I need to demonstrate, I need to create some sort of link, I need to give reason. So there's a, you know, it might seem a simple how question, but there's a, there's a bit to that. Like that was a 20 mark um, case study question um, in 2012. So I've just got a little snippet here of how you might um, answer that. So by using leasing, okay, so how? We're doing it by using leasing, and um, Qantas is able to purchase its new fleet of A380 Airbuses, which will lead to more customers on the flights, increasing sales, and ultimately profits. Okay, so how can they, a different source of funds, so a source of funds is leasing to achieve its objectives, so the objectives of sales and profits. So by having or by investing in the new A380 Airbuses, they're a larger plane. Obviously you can get more customers on those flights, therefore you can sell more tickets and I hopefully make more profit. So again, this how can um, question is really asking you to show and demonstrate, give reasons, etc. And the same with the why. Um, you know, why is market research effective in achieving the marketing objective. So why? It's give reasons, it's inquire into. So don't be fooled that it's a it's a it's a basic word and not writing much on it. You you really still do need to get the detail in those answers. All right, and that's um, just a visual on what I was talking about in skills. So the the lower order questions like the list and outline and scribe have low marks attached to them. As we move through, we can see things like examine, um, discuss, and then we move um, up to the higher order of verbs there of evaluate and assess. Okay, and, and, and they tend to be the 20 mark type questions there. All right, so we, we move on to now resources um, and where you can access some help, et cetera. So the NESA past HSC papers, that's something that you obviously would know and have access to. If you can get hold of Catholic school uh, past papers and independent trial papers, and I know they're floating around, acehsc.net, okay, this over here is, um, is a website, they've just fixed that up recently. Um, students are, are posting exam papers, et cetera, on there, um, some of them with answers, et cetera, as well. So you should have a look at that. They've got study notes and a collection of resources and they're all free. Um, the NESA sample answer booklets, these are the workbooks. They're not produced every single year, but they just give you um, typical answers to past papers um, that students have written um, for those particular questions. Now, they're in, I've seen them in libraries. Um, of, you know, your teachers might have them as well. So you might ask your teachers for those or go to the library and, and borrow those. Cambridge HSC checkpoints have um, 
revision books. And again, they're probably in your libraries as well. And there's an app there that you can test yourself. Uh, Matthew Parsons um, for Business Studies and Economics has graciously opened up his online learning website. Um, he's a teacher that with the COVID-19 has generously um, allowed uh, access to uh, his videos and revision quizzes, etc. And they're really good. So especially if you don't have um, you know, other online learning means, that's, that's a really good one. Art of Smart, another good website, if you haven't seen that in all your subjects. Um, revision, past questions, breakdown of exam analysis, uh, pretty good material on that site, and that's all free. And um, the Nessa quiz site. So basically, if you go to that link there, you type in your subject, like business studies, and it will randomly select um, past HSC multiple choice questions. That's a really good technique. I've got 15 or 20 minutes, go onto the site, have a look at some multiple choice questions, get the immediate feedback there. All right, and finally, um, the Qantas case study book. Uh, there's the Apple case study I mentioned in this video as well. That's a link to um, an online case study for Apple. But um, you know, your libraries and that now do have the, the Qantas case study book. Um, it's a very thorough treatment of the, the syllabus in, in reference to Qantas. And there's some other ones floating around. The Excel study guide, and again, these are in libraries. You know, as a study guide goes, they're, they're pretty good uh, books to um, just to look at how, you know, other people have presented the information that you might have learned in class. If you're a video learner, and hopefully so with watching this particular video, um, there are some videos around um, on YouTube. Um, Marco Cimino here has a good YouTube uh, channel in which he has all the HSE video videos there, breaks down different components of the course. HSC Hub, that's a paid um, uh, prescription there. I know some schools have that. They're, they're sort of shorter videos um, that you can have, but you know you have to pay for those. Um, yeah, so accessing these resources. And again, you know, if, if your school's giving you uh, lots of good resources and access to that, these might be some just other additional ways to, um, you know, to get access to resources. All right, so that brings us to the end of our first video. So hopefully, um, you know, you've got an idea of how to prepare better for the exam and some techniques, et cetera. Um, and um, watch video two um, as that breaks down the exam specifically with past papers, et cetera. So take care and good luck with your HSC exam in business studies. Welcome back to HSC business studies. This is the second video in the series looking at exam technique, tips and traps for business studies. Video one, which you may have had a look at, looks at exam structure, how to perform business in the business exam, study methods, revision, resources, etc. This video, video two, will concentrate on exam technique and break down the different components of the exam looking at paragraph writing and sample answers. So you can see in the multiple choice, we'll have to look at some techniques around preparing and typical type questions. We'll look at short answer samples and sample answers and how to tackle those questions. Look at the last couple of years business studies reports and how to address those and break the question down. And the same with the extended response looking at a, a table format of past questions and um, what they've asked on the different topics. Planning and reading time. So during the five minutes reading time in the exam, you're not allowed to, to write in that time, but the suggestion is that you start backwards by looking at section three and section four first. So the idea would be to go to section three, have a look at the business report, read the report carefully, look at the questions they're asking you in the report. Then in section four, look at the extended response questions, and there's two of them where you have to make a choice of one of those two and have a pretty good idea then and then, then and there of what question you will answer uh, in the exam. If you have time remaining, you should then look through the short answer questions and then the multiple choice questions. 
So when the exam starts, that first five to 10 minutes, depending on how much time you want to spend, but you should be planning your responses to the report and to the case study question. You would be given an exam booklet and booklets to, to answer those questions in, and there's nothing wrong with using the first page or the inside page as a planning page, identify it as a planning page, put your ideas down that you're thinking of in that first five minutes of the exam. Once you've done that, you should then proceed to work through the paper from the multiple choice questions onwards. The idea is you've already seen the questions, seen the report, have an idea of what the question's on. So as you're doing the multiple choice and the short answer section of the paper, you're sort of mulling over the ideas that might come up um, to help you answer those questions. And you can just go to your planning page and jot those down and just keep proceeding with the exam. So the idea is that you're thinking about that in the back of your mind while you're doing the, the paper, um, and that might help you with some planning ideas. Let's have a look at some multiple choice questions and to how do we tackle this part of the exam. So typically, there's roughly five multiple choice questions from each topic. There's four topics. So obviously, there's a, a selection of questions from each of the topics. Multiple choice questions typically look at key terms and concepts and testing of those. One of the techniques that are used is to try to cover the answers, read the question, have an idea of what the answer might be first before you start looking at the answer. Sometimes students rush reading the question and go straight to the answers. So the idea would be read question carefully, have an idea of what the answer could be from your knowledge and then proceed to uh, answer the questions or look at the answers. Read all parts of the question carefully, read the stimulus carefully um, and identify the key words in the question. And there may be some formulas in that that are used. One of the other methods that students use is when answering the question, um, once they've answered the question on the answer sheet, that on the actual exam paper, they might make a mark next to some of the questions that they might not have been sure on, so that if there's any time remaining at the end of the exam, to come back and, and to do those questions or to look at those questions again. Question one from the 2012 HSC exam, typically the first question, first couple of questions are sort of leading questions, tend to be relatively easier than, than other, part, other questions as a means of sort of settling you into the paper. So looking at this question here, we've got an accountant decides to use the services of a cleaning company for one day a week. What is this an example of? So we've got four key terms here um, and looking at each of the terms, we should know what they mean. Um, development, downsizing, reducing costs, employing people from overseas and outsourcing seems to be the standout answer there as a means of getting someone else to do certain functions or, or services within the business. Our second question we have here is a typical critical path question. And every um, so often these questions come up and students often get confused on, on working this out. And the reason is the definition of critical path, this is a scheduling uh, tool in operations, but basically the definition is it's the minimum number of top days needed to complete all tasks and finish a project. So when, when students hear minimum, they start automatically looking for the least number of days, but in actual fact, it's the most number of days, okay? So the definition is the least or the minimum days to complete all tasks, but the, but the actual calculation means that we're looking at the maximum number of days, okay? So if we look at this particular diagram here, task A would be done first and we can either uh, go towards the top of the diagram or the bottom of the diagram. Okay, so the idea is what we'd add up the number of days and it's going to be the highest number of days. It's going to be that particular path. So task A, C, G, then J, and that adds up to five, that's 10, 15, that's 17 days there. 
So 17 would be the answer there. Now notice the other answers that are given would be typically the, the other um, paths that could be taken. So again, it's the calculation is the, we're looking for a maximum days, but the definition is the minimum days. And the idea here is that we can't go, so if we went along this way, B, D to H, we, we can't proceed any further until task G is done. That's what it means. So C and E and D and H, they can be done simultaneously. And that's the benefit of this graph in scheduling. Okay, we've got another question here or two questions from a, another year in the HSC. This one's a, a little bit simpler in terms of the layout, um, but it's, it's a double question. We've got 14 and 15. So again, from our definition, we're looking for the, the days or the highest number of days from whichever path we take. So I'm looking here, we start with five, that's four, that's six, I'm thinking we're probably, and that's two, so we're probably gonna go this way. And then we go five and then two. So we've got five, six as 11 and six, uh, that's uh, 16. And then we've got the two, which is the 18 days. If we add up the others, 18 would be the highest number or the minimum time needed to complete all tasks. So C would be the answer there. In our next question, but it says if activity EC, so there's EC there, if that was delayed and take six days, okay? So what that would mean is that um, up here, instead of that being three, we're gonna add six there. So it says, how long will the project be delayed, okay? So the idea of delaying means, well, we're going to see how many days that compared to this particular answer here. So if we add these up, we've got five, we've got four, that's nine. Now we've got six, which is 15, and that's two. So that's making 17 days. Okay. So when we're comparing it to the 18 days from the normal path or from the previous question, without the delay, then we can see here that there's really no delay. So if it took us 18 days normally, and now with this delay, it still takes us 17, we still haven't reached the 18. It's a little bit of a trick question uh, there in that one. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so sometimes the questions will be asking us for specific content or key, key words and terminology. Question four here, what does the expense ratio measure? So when you're looking at the expense, there's two expenses ratios, sorry, there's two ratios um, that uh, cover the efficiency of the business. And I guess you should know that as soon as you hear the word expense, that's an efficiency ratio there, okay? So each of the different ratios would measure different things. So for example, the net profit ratio would be a profitability. The debt to equity ratio or solvency ratio would be measuring solvency. Let's have a look at question 10. Which of the following would improve the financial position of a business? So sometimes the questions here, they ask, um, they're asking us to compare uh, two lots of answers, but just using a lower, higher term, um, like in this particular question. So if you want to improve the financial position of a business, would it be better to have a lower or higher current ratio? So the idea would be that a current ratio measures liquidity, two to one would be an ideal um, amount. So the lower the current ratio, the, maybe the inability to meet short-term obligations. So here we would say it's probably higher. So that would knock out A and D. So this is the idea of getting rid of questions or answers that are wrong so that we're res re restricting the leftover answers so we're making a better educated guess and, and the probability of getting it right would be a bit higher. So the idea here is it's a higher, sorry, we'd knock out C, my apologies there. So I have D and B would still be um, uh, part of the answer. So the next part is would we want a lower accounts receivable turnover ratio or a higher accounts receivable turnover ratio? 
So the account receivable turnover ratio is the ability to, to uh, turn over your debt or have customers who buy on credit to pay those bills. So the idea is that, um, that the lower the ratio, okay, in terms of um, um, the number of times a year that you collect it, the better it would be. So when you work out that ratio, it gives you an answer of 10, 12, um, 15 times, and that gets converted into days by dividing 365 into the answer, okay? So in looking at that there, we would want a lower. So D is wrong, and then B would be our answer there. All right, let's move on. Next question, 2014 HSC, a business is planning to increase its market share by merging with a competitor. So market share tells us something about the, what the answer might be and merging. So which financial, what financial objective would we, um, would best illustrate this? So looking at it all together, there's no mention of, of debt there, okay? So, so D would be crossed out there. There's no mention of debt, so D is gone. Um, in terms of liquidity, we know that that's a short-term current assets, current liabilities. There's no mention of that there, so that would go. So it leaves us A and C. In terms of is it growth or profitability, the market share, I mean, that's just sales, um, looking at percentage sales in the market. But the idea of merging means you're getting larger. So A would be the best answer there. So notice the process of elimination that I went through in doing that. Sometimes multiple choice questions have the financial calculations. And um, in the last few years, they've decided, NESA has decided to give students the formula. So you don't get a formula sheet per se, but what if they're asking you to do a ratio calculation, then what they typically give you is something like that, a formula in brackets next to what they're asking you to do. However, just be careful because there's other calculations, non-ratio calculations, which you would be required to know that they don't give you the formula. So in order to do the net profit ratio, we need net profit. Now we look at the table, so just be careful, we've got 14 and 15, okay, and this is an extract. So we can't see net profit there. So obviously we have to use the data that's there to calculate the net profit, okay? Now to do that, then you should know um, what the formula is. So the formula here is gross profit minus expenses, and that's one that's not given, okay? Okay, so it's a not given formula. So from here, make sure we're looking at the right year, 2014. So we look at 2014, gross profit's 50,000, expenses are 20,000. That gives us the 30,000 net profit figure. Now we can put it into the formula. So the net profit divided by sales is the 30,000 from the answer there, uh, divided by the 160 in sales, and then putting that as a percentage gives us 20%. So again, there's some formulas that are non-ratios that you might need to know, okay? Let's move on to the 2017 exam, question six. So some questions have a stimulus attached to them. And with that stimulus, you obviously have to read that carefully to ascertain the answer. A sole trader, one owner of a business, invest $500,000 into her business. What is this an example of? So again, if we look at this process of elimination first, okay, so if we say, we can go through the answers here. Is it an overdraft? No, an overdraft is a loan. There's no borrowing. We've got investing. Okay, retain profits um, is a, a type of um, uh, internal finance. Our next two, we've got internal debt finance and internal equity. So I guess the debt component is what's wrong. So we're left with B and D there. Now, retain profits, it doesn't say anything about money that's been made in the business previously. It says puts in her invest of into her business. So she's putting the money in herself. So that would knock out retain profits, and that would be an internal equity source of finance. 
Looking at our next question, question 10. So we've got a, a visual here. We've got salty sunscreen for teenagers and we've got it for adults there. We've got a price of $15 for teenagers and $10, $10 for adults. So the question is, they've got the same ingredients. Basically, it's the same product. This is an example of which of the following. Okay, so again, this is a question where we can't sort of know the answer first. We've got to look through the selections before we can make a decision. All right, price leading, okay, not a syllabus term. Um, uh, so that's probably not going to be correct. Um, we've got price skimming. Now, if you know the definition of skimming, skimming is, you know, setting a higher price of what the market can bear. But because we've got two different products, um, you know, it's not going to be skimming, although some students might have got confused on that, saying it's a higher price for teenagers than, than adults. Penetration is a, is a low price. Okay, so again, this notion that there's two different prices. But, you know, when you look at the, um, the consumer law section of marketing, um, you will realise that... Um, it's price discrimination. And the definition basically is charging uh, different prices for the same product uh, to different groups. All right, let's move on. Okay. So our next question, knowing the syllabus is probably an important part of your preparation. It is a bit more, it is a very important part. So sometimes we, we get questions like this, where it's asking us, um, a question that's directly comes from the syllabus. So the question is on transformed resources, that's part of the operations topic. And when I've got it here, this is the syllabus extract. Under inputs, we've got transformed and transforming and transformed resources are materials, information, customers. Customers, information, materials. So knowing that syllabus, um, and the techniques, if you looked at in video one about memorizing the syllabus with the closed passage, et cetera, well then that, that's an easy mark there. Okay, let's have a look at section two, our short answer type questions. All right, so in section two, basically, again, the questions in the short answers can come from any of the four topics. This time, in this section, we would need to take particular account of the verb that's used, the glossary verb. And we've mentioned that in, in video one um, and breaking down those verbs and, and what to, to do with those verbs. So we need to give more effort and analysis to questions with higher marks. That's just a given. Um, be concise in your writing whilst using stimulus material and examples. Often get that from students um, asking, oh, do I use my Qantas case study? Do I use my IKEA case study in short answers? And, and the answer to that is yes, if, if it warrants and it's going to help you answer the question, um, definitely. And obviously, key terminology and concepts is an important part of this section as well. All right, so I've got a sample question here, and this comes from the, the NESA workbooks uh, that are produced each uh, most years. So we've got our stimulus material here. Sue is a sole trader whose business is growing rapidly as sales are increasing. As a result of the growth, she needs to purchase stock worth $10,000. We look at the question, explain a potential conflict between short-term and long-term financial objective for Sue. So we know that this particular question comes from the finance topic, it comes from under the role, and part of looking at the role and looking at the objectives was this short and long-term um, conflict that, that, um, that can occur. So let's have a look at the way the students answered the question. We've got our explain question first of all. So we know that explain means looking at the cause and effect, okay? So we would circle the verb and we'd make sure that we're talking about conflict, so key word, and we've got short and long-term obligations there in terms of objectives. So let's have a look at the answer. A potential conflict between a short-term and long-term financial objective would be balancing liquidity and long-term growth. Straight away, we've attacked the question. 
So what's the conflict they've identified? That there's a problem with liquidity in the short term and growth in the long term. This can be seen by how Sue may attempt to lower her current liabilities in order to increase and improve her liquidity. However, in doing so, however, in doing so, Sue limits her business. So here's the conflict, limits her business for potential investment opportunities, um, which may limit the business's ability to, and I'll just uh, move that out of the way, to achieve long-term, long-term growth. Three mark question. In terms of the answer, um, you know, could we talk about the, the stock and the 10,000? Yes, do we have to? Not in, in this way, the way this person has answered the question is that they've identified the short and long-term objectives and they've identified the conflict. So basically, by achieving one, we are foregoing the other. And, and that's been identified in the answer. And again, any of these questions I go through in the video, you're quite welcome to stop the video and have a look back at those at any stage, pause the video um, to help you there. All right, our next question, and I apologize for, might be a little bit difficult to read. Um, in this particular question, question 22, a business develops video games. It had three different games for sale last year. The table shows forecast and actual sales for each game. So we've got game A, B, C, we've got forecasted. So that's what we were hoping to achieve and the actual results there. Now, notice the verb in the first question, why? Why is this information? So why means give us reasons that this is an important part of the marketing process. So if you know the marketing process, that's our, our SMEDI word that we're, uh, we looked at in the previous video, so knowing the content, then this information, it's financial information, which is in the last section of the marketing plan, would help us to make future decisions. So this information is important because it allows the business to monitor its performance, comparing the, comparing the forecasted values with actual performance. This allows the business to control uh, taking corrective action by revising its marketing strategies. Pretty, pretty good answer, very good answer in fact, because it picks up on this table here is about comparing planned results or forecasted results with actual performance. That is mentioned in the syllabus under the marketing plan or marketing processes. And all they've done is saying why and the why is it allows us to take corrective action and revise the marketing strategy. Let's look at the second part of the question. With reference to the information, recommend a strategy for promoting gain B. So our verb here is recommend. So again, why, recommend, pretty similar. Give reasons for using this particular strategy. Okay, so um, when we look at this particular question, all right, so the strategy we need to identify. Now, one of the tips in the short answer questions is just don't um, sort of waffle around the question. Get straight in and answer the question. So straight away, advertisements, underline. There we go. There's our strategy. Okay. Notice how they've answered this. Advertisements are paid non-personal messages promoted through a medium and are very effective in promoting game B. So not only have we got the strategy, we've incorporated a definition of the strategy and we've also given a recommended or saying why it's effective for game B. Really, really good start to the answer. This is because it increases awareness. So now we're giving reasons why we're recommending it. This is because it increases awareness about the product, providing information about its features and advantages. This would allow the business to differentiate game B and thus stimulate demand. All right, so again, if we're looking at game B and, and we look up the top here, that we can see that the forecasted results and the actual results, there, there's something gone wrong there, okay, as opposed to game A and B. So the business 
therefore could advertise through social media. So that's an advertisement, game magazines. This would allow the business to reach its forecasted amount of um, 200,000. So with reference to the information, we've used the 200,000, so we've used the data, and we've also uh, addressed the verb of recommend, and we've given a strategy, and we've given some reasons around that. Next question, explain the interdependence of finance and operations in a business. So you would know that interdependence covers, is covered in all four topics, it's a major part of the course, and you should be you know, putting some effort into knowing the linkages between each of the topics and being able to explain this. This question comes up quite regularly. It's come up in, in a report question in the past, and potentially it could even be a case study question. It hasn't been asked yet, but potentially could be. So the way that I teach my students to, to answer a question like this is it's an explain, so we're looking at the cause and the effect, but we're also looking at the linkages between them. So let's have a look at this answer. It says finance allocate the budget for operations processes to ensure they have adequate funding for inputs, transformation processes to make the output. So what can we learn from this answer here is we don't just say, well, finance gives money to operations to make the product. That's the simple answer. What we've done is we've, we've you know, sophisticated the answer by putting there allow, oh sorry, allocating a budget. So instead of saying money, we've got budget. And instead of saying to make the product, which is the output at the end, we've actually, you know, mentioned aspects of operations processes and inputs, et cetera, to make the product. So much better. Finance, for example, will give operations funds to purchase inputs and pay for equipment or labor needed to produce outputs. Operations uses these funds to determine the quality capable with the available funds. Example, high funds means high quality value products. Operations, implementation of quality and cost controls will create more funds through sales that finance uses to allocate new or change existing budgets. Now, the reason why I like this answer is, one, it's specific. So we've got specific parts of operations and marketing, we've, sorry, operations and finance in terms of the budget and the processes. But I like how it comes back. So not only have we said that uh, finance gives money to operations to make the product, if operations make a quality product and use these cost controls, they will generate more funds for the business. So that's money coming back to finance to use in other areas of the business. Very good answer. Next, we've got in our short answers, um, potential calculations. Now, looking at this question um, from this particular HSC year, and that is, we don't actually have a question asking to calculate but we've got a question asking to discuss the gearing of Andrew's discount tires. And it's five marks. So in order to answer this particular question in terms of the gearing, well, we would need to be able to calculate the gearing. So the question's asking us to look at the advantages and or disadvantages of gearing. So one, we've actually got to work out the gearing now we look in here, we've got industry average gearing ratio. So we've got our formula at 80%, okay? And we've got an extract here and it looks like a balance sheet with our assets and liabilities, okay? So the first thing you need to do in this question is calculate the level of gearing. Now, if we're gonna look at the advantages and disadvantages, we have to determine is the gearing high or is the gearing low before we can make comments about that, okay? So using our formula of total liabilities divided by the total equity. So we'd need to add up our liabilities here. Okay. And then, so that's two, one and five. So we've got $8,000 there and divided by 16. So, you know, looking at that there, that's 50%. We've worked out that as 50%. And we'll see that in the sample answer on the next page. Okay. So just keep this in mind. We've got our table. We need to do our calculation first, and then we've got 80%. So normally questions in business might 
give you an idea that the business is struggling in a particular area. So there, there's a problem and we need to fix that problem. But when we look at 50% gearing, then we're thinking the industry average is 80. Well, that's probably not too bad compared to the industry average. So let's have a look. Here's a sample answer for the question. Okay, so first of all, we've got a definition. So we can see down here in orange that um, how we've broken the question down. Okay, so we've got a definition. We have to use the data, the stimulus. We've got to talk about the advantages and disadvantages, and that's addressing the verb. So we did a bit of work about what you write, the content. So that's around gearing and solvency and how you write it in the verb. So let's look at the question, sorry, the answer here. So we've defined gearing as the relationship between debt and equity. The gearing of Andrew's discount ties is 50%. So that's what we calculated previously. So we've got that. This can be compared to the industry average of 80%. Short, sharp, clear answers in terms of sentences here. Andrew's discount ties gearing of 50% indicates that the business is in a sound and safe financial position. So there's an advantage there, okay? So it's in a sound, safe position. And the advantages of this is that it would be low risk and hence would have low debt repayments. So there's the advantages of identifying that the gearing is low, okay? This would lead to a lower risk of business failure. So we've got another reason or another advantage there. Then in this particular answer, the student has then said a disadvantage of low gearing could be that the business may be missing out on using more debt than equity, which would or could lead to greater potential for profit. So do you need to do both advantages and disadvantages? No, but it's, it, it shows it as a better answer, doesn't it? Because pretty, pretty cluey concept here that low levels of gearing, although safe and you know, less risk, it could mean that the business should be or could potentially make more profit by borrowing more money and investing that in the business. So another good answer there. And again, any of these answers, you can go back at any time and look at those. All right, let's have a look um, at our next question. Our next question here is to justify the method of payment that would be most effective in reducing the business's financial risk. So I try to select different questions with different verbs just to show you how to tackle those questions. So this is a justify. So justify the method of payment. So when we're breaking down this particular question here, um, what we need to do obviously is to address the verb, which is to justify, but the content that the, the learn about is the method of payment that's most effective in reducing financial risk. And that's five marks. So Students in this particular year uh, perform pretty poorly in this question um, because it's on um, looking at methods of payments, you know, the last section of financial strategies, which students find the most difficult part of the entire course. So let's have a look at it. The method of payment with the lowest risk for the importer is clean payment. So we're just answering the question straight away. Lowest risk, clean payment. With this method, the goods will be shipped and received before the importer pays for them, which reduces risk. So there we go. Definition means that the goods will be shipped and received before the importer pays for them, which reduces the risk, okay? The risk to the importer is minimized as it allows them to inspect the goods for quality and quantity prior to payment. While this method requires the exporter to trust the importer, it is an effective method to reduce the business's risk. So we could have a number of different answers uh, to this question, um, but the way that this has been answered, there's justification. And the justification is around um, here about there's obviously uh, less risk and being able to inspect the quality and the quantity of the goods before the, the payment is released. This next question here, and the reason why I've taken this out is just to show you some of the marking criteria that teachers use when they're marking your HSE exam. So again, we've got a stimulus um, uh, material here that we need to read carefully. And then the question follows. A large business repairs trucks that transport heavy loads. 
the business struggles to complete many different types of repairs in an efficient manner. It has had difficulty meeting legal regulations and customer expectations. So our question is to describe two transformation processes that might apply to uh, this particular business here. Now it's a lower order verb in describe and we look down to our criteria, provides characteristics and features of two transformation processes. So all we need is um, features um, and characteristics there. So critical path analysis is a sequencing and scheduling tool that the business could use. So transformation process, operation syllabus, this person has identified this aspect of it. For instance, the repairs could be analysed so that it, it was known which parts of the processes could be completed at the same time. So there's a, a, an advantage, if you like, or a feature, thus reducing the overall repair time. So there's our one transformation process. What features? It's a sequencing and scheduling tool and a little bit of feature is that we can perform tasks simultaneously. Our second one, process layout, is placing the processes in a logical order of repair. So there we go, definition. This would help speed up the process by setting out equipment and materials in the most efficient way, therefore reducing costs. So you can see in that answer there, this particular student has done a little bit more than describe and then accessing um, the full range of marks there. We move on to the business report now. This is section three. In section three of the paper, we must write a business report. So we've got that, we must. Now, again, students in the past, um, what's a business report? How do I write a business report, etc.? And these are some, you know, important area that at school, your teacher should be going in and you should be practicing this. The business report has a stimulus, typically has problems or experiencing problems. And then obviously the clues regarding the cause of the problem and solutions would be identified in the stimulus. Use the question to make the headings used in the report. And we'll have a bit of a look at that. So that's pretty important. Now, do you have to follow a specific format? No, you don't. I know out there, um, sometimes it might be um, conveyed that we have to have certain headings and in those headings, we have to do certain things. No, the only thing you need to do is to have headings and subheadings, etc. cetera, um, but you need to address the question and make it look like it's a report. In the last few years of HSC marking, again, it's, it's, um, it hasn't been a major issue, but still some students are failing to write in a business report format, and that really is limiting their marks in accessing the B and the A range. All right, so what should a typical report style look at? <clears throat> I always say to students, the first heading you should put is executive summary. As soon as you put the word executive summary, this is an indication you understand what a report is. It's usually the first heading and we're away without report style writing. Okay, you can see here, we constantly use the business name, whatever's given. Um, so in the past, they tend to select businesses that, um, you know, that HSC students would have a bit of an idea around. So we've had pizza, we've had juice, we've had mobile phone companies, etc. And you just need to keep using the business name. Again, it's a little trick as to show that you re referring to the stimulus. Okay. This report outlines and evaluates. So we, in our executive summary, we're basically looking at what some of the issues that are accounted, identifying the business, and then we're using the question, so the question, to have sentences around the question. So one sentence for each part of the question to identify you know, how you're gonna answer that question. Then we come to the main part of our answer and we've got headings, okay? So we must use headings. So for example, um, in this particular question here, outline the role of financial management, we would make that question into a heading. So our heading would simply be the role of financial management. Now there's no real right or wrong headings here. The only thing is that you, it needs to um, basically align with the question. In terms of report and subheadings, we could then go A, financial objectives, 
and then one and look at solvency as an objective. So we've got the, the, uh, the main heading, the role of financial management, we've got objectives and then we've got examples. So this sort of um, layering in report format is, you know, it's just a good way to set out your report. Now, can we have something at the end? Yes, we have a summary, conclusion, whatever you want to call it, recommendation, sometimes students write. And again, it's just to tie up your answer. So remember, every piece of writing that in terms of extended response writing, even reports, etc., it has a beginning, has an introduction, it has middle or body, and it has some sort of conclusion. Okay, so hopefully that's, that's helpful there. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go through, look at a couple of years HSE questions. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but just to give you some tips, etc. So this was last year's HSC question 25. So we've got a business, Ruse Outback Eatery, PTY LTD, so it's a private company, is opening an additional restaurant in New South Wales. They plan to position the restaurant as an exclusive restaurant specialising in modern Australian food with quality customer service. The owner requires assistance with the following. So we've got there something about the business and, and what their sort of aim or plan is. And then we've got some dot points around acquisition and development of staff, raising some additional funds for the day-to-day -day running of the business and the monitoring of working capital. So this is gonna give us an idea as to what types of answers we're going to use and the questions that come from there. Now, the interesting thing about this question in 2019 was there's only two bullet point questions. In previous years, there's three. Now, what you must know in the report is that this question here will cover two topics only. So the first thing I'm saying to you is to read the question. So this first question asking us to discuss the methods of acquisition and development of staff, this is the HR topic, okay? So this is a HR question, and the second question is a finance question. So what that tells us is that in the, in the next section of the paper, um, HR and finance will not be tested. It will be um, marketing and um, operations. Okay, so that's a, you, you, you gotta know that. So you, you can anticipate which topics are being tested. So, <clears throat> the two bullet points sort of restricted students in how much they can write. And again, the HSC exam questions seem to be getting students to, to write less or to limit what they can write. So you really do need to show your understanding in a bit more detail. So instead of saying recommend strategies and you could do two, three, four, etc., where, you know, the NESA is limiting that so that they're trying to get a better quality answer. All right, so discuss means advantages and disadvantages. So what it would be, so we'd need to talk about acquisition and development, what they entail and what are the advantages of, and disadvantages of that, whilst, you know, trying to incorporate, you know, the stimulus material. So as an exclusive restaurant specialising in Australian food, we're probably going to acquire staff with some expertise and skill in that area. So that would be something that you might pick up in your planning. And then two appropriate working capital strategies and looking at those from the syllabus, we've got the leasing and the sale and lease back and then how we would put that into there. All right, let's move on. <clears throat> so that's the 2019 question. So the 2018 question, so stimulus material is around Fast Burgers LTD. So that's a public company. And again, we've got some pretty detailed information about the business and you know, some of the issues surrounding that business. So I've just identified here, use the stimulus, highlight underlying aspects of it, use the questions as headings for your report. So, what would be our headings in our report after our executive summary would be to describe the role of operations management. So that could just simply be the role of operations management. 
The second one, to demonstrate why CSR should remain a key concern. Okay, so a bit of a longer question, but we could just simply have corporate social responsibility, something along those lines. And then we've got recommend three HR strategies. So that could just simply be human resource strategies. Okay, they could maintain uh, its record as an excellent employer. Now you can see down the bottom there in the orange is the last part of the question, recommend means give reasons. And if for example, we were to use rewards, then the reasons around that would be to motivate staff that drive um, for success in the business. And then that leads to greater output, efficiency, et cetera. So one of the things I'm big on for answers is we're, we're building those linkages and we're building those um, implications, if you like. So we're recommending rewards because it motivates and drives staff to success. Great. But then what happens then? So this is the, the in-depth look at the answer. So you're recommending because it does this success and that success leads to output, greater output efficiency, less cost, more profit. So that would be, a, a, you know, the detail in your answer there. All right. Um, 2017 exam. Now, the reason why I, I took this question out as well is to show you that sometimes you're given financial data in the stimulus. And this particular year, students struggled in terms of knowing how to use the sales and the profit levels. Yes, we've got some stimulus material here for Sporty Goods Limited. Um, and we've got that it's facing increased competition and they're concerned about the positioning. So there's some of the issues around the business. Okay, so again, must use stimulus. We're using the questions down here as headings. So in this particular uh, report, um, the first question is to outline the strategic role of financial management. So notice there that uh, two years in a row that it's around this strategic role, different topics. So when we look at this particular question, this is a financial topic question. Um, we're looking for another topic. So recommend two strategies to improve financial performance. So that would be another financial question or financial part. And then the last part is on marketing about the importance of monitoring and controlling the business's marketing strategy. So again, we would use the headings to develop our, sorry, use the questions to develop our headings. And then the verb is obviously a focus there. So when we're outlining one strategic role in the syllabus, no strategic role, we've got interdependence, we've got the objectives, um, and we've got, you know, the strategic role itself, long, you know, that long-term financial planning and using the resources of the business. Okay, so this would indicate to us that that's probably um, a smaller treatment than the other two sections because of the verb. So outlining and giving the features and characteristics and then the recommending the two strategies. So we'd have to do more with the recommend and those financial strategies would need to match up here with uh, the stimulus material. So obviously we're looking here, profits have been falling and sales have been falling. So we'd probably look at strategies for profitability and they could be things like um, revenue controls or cost controls and, and looking at those. The last part's interesting about the importance of monitoring and controlling the marketing strategy. And again, specific part of, of the syllabus, um, that's the last part of processes. And, and what we know from the syllabus there is comparing the planned results um, with actual results and revising the marketing strategy itself. So we'd need to talk about that in that particular uh, part of our answer. All right, so hopefully that's sort of broken down that question uh, for you. 2016, majority of our stimulus material is in the form of a financial report. So we've got Lee's Catering, the small business, high profile chef, food is excellent quality, it has many bookings for future events. So we've got a little bit of material here and then we've got this uh, financial data. So 
a little bit different. In terms of the question, it says a potential new partner is concerned about the accuracy of the financial reports and the effectiveness of current management. So we've got a little bit more in terms of what they perceive some of the problems might be. So you're asked to write a report that explains the possible limitations of the financial reports. So it's an area of the syllabus, limitations, financial reports. They're things like uh, valuing assets, uh, normalised earnings, uh, timing issues, etc. And that particularly you'd need to look at the possible limitations of that. Now, this is a little bit of a tricky area of the syllabus. Um, that students get confused on because it's quite technical around the finance part of it. But it's basically saying that when financial reports are produced like this one, it's an extract, we, we don't get the full financial picture. And sometimes that's an, an advantage for the business if they're trying to, to lure in investors. Other times it's a, it's a disadvantage um, because it doesn't show the true, um, you know, the true, um, uh, figures and how the business is going. Our second part of the question is recommend appropriate working capital strategies. Okay, so we've got our working capital strategies. So, you know, um, looking at those strategies around um, sale and lease back and, and, and leasing, you could even look at control of current assets, control of current liabilities and within those. The last part of the question is asking us to evaluate pricing strategy. Okay, so we've gone explain, probably mid-order verb, recommend, getting a bit high, and then, you know, at the top of the, the ordered verbs there, evaluate, making judgments around a suitable pricing strategy. Okay, so we'd need to be looking at current. So we've got liquidity problems here. We've got gross profit uh, being lower than industry average. We've got a very high expense ratio. Okay, so that would be stimulus that we'd need to refer to. All right, let's move on. What I've got here is a sample, a part sample of an answer, just to show you how to set the report. So we've got business report on Lee's catering for potential partner. So they've picked up on the, the, the stimulus in terms of the heading there, and it's by a business consultant. Now, some students make up names, etc. But, but that's fine. So the executive summary is our first heading. And I'm not going to read through it, but basically um, the executive summary will look at the issues or concerns in the business and then address different parts of the question. Our first heading, notice the numbering, number one, limitations of financial reports. There are various limitations of financial reports and then it lists them capitalised expenses, uh, valuing assets, um, etc. So just to show you what a report looks like. Then when we're breaking that down, so we're going 1.1, looking at capitalised expenses. Okay, so then they're looking at that. And when you, later on, you might like to stop and have a look at and read the answer, it's basically looking at the cause and effect, like what is the limitation of a capitalised expense on the business. Then we've got our second part of the question, which is working capital management as a heading. And this is what I like, and I would suggest um, to you as well. So we, we put the heading and then we have a lead in, like some lead in sentences around uh, what we're writing about working capital. And then we identify the specific aspect of it. So 1.1, control of current assets. So we've got a lead in, and then we've got our first heading down the bottom here, and then we would start addressing the question. So we're looking for recommend type um, um, references. And then our final part is price points as a pricing strategy. Now you can put pricing strategy, whatever the heading you like, but they're uh, using three price points. And again, it's, it's not the whole answer. I've just taken extracts of the answer there. So that just shows you how to write a report and what it looks like. All right, in, in 2015, um, we've got fit, fast bikes, and again, some stimulus and um, our questions around here. So I've just put that in at a later date. So you've got all the questions together and you might like to have a look at that 
and um, look at the sample answers um, or the suggested marking guidelines, etc. In that particular question in 2015, I've just picked up. So you probably, from what I've done so far, um, you know, identified that it has to be report format. We've got to look at each part of the question. We've got to use the terminology. We have to address the verb. It's got to be cohesive, logical, well-written. Okay. 2014, this particular year, we've got a higher order verb. We go recommend, then discuss, then explain. So really don't take for granted that that first bullet point question is an outline or describe lower order. So this really dictates the quantity and the quality of your answer. So just be you're very aware of that. That's going to direct you to how much you write. Now, remember, overall, we're writing about 800 words. So, you know, if we divide it evenly, which we usually don't, but if we divide it easily, e evenly, it's around 300 words each section. But higher order verbs need more treatment. And again, you can look at that question later. One of the things that uh, NESA produces is it gives overall advice on how students answer the question. And this is on the NESA site um, underneath the exam paper for each year. So in this particular question, candidates showed strength in using the stimulus, explaining an appropriate financial option. Okay, so appropriate meaning it's relevant to the stimulus. Comparing a variety of issues associated with both outsourcing and the factory expansion and the relationship. So this you know, there's some really uh, strong analysis in there and it has the report features, okay? So this is a general feedback. So what do students need to improve on? Students were pretty lost when it comes to global factors, um, you know, scanning and learning, um, research and development, etc. Students didn't really know that part of the syllabus well, the last part, very last dot point in, in operations. And that was a, you know, a concern making reference to the stimulus throughout the response and relating the global factors to how the business operates. So this might give you, and again, you can have a look back at the question and um, look at you know, the feedback from the marking center. 2013 question. Now 2012 and 13, uh, 12 was the um, new format for the business studies exam. So 2012 was the first year of the the major changes they made, and, and 2013, obviously the second year. But just wanted to show you this because this 12 and 13, the actual question was in sentence format, not in um, stem and leaf, okay? Um, stem type question, all right. So here we're asked to write a report recommending marketing and financial strategies to improve the performance of the business. It's pretty straightforward because it's basically saying, you know, write about a couple of marketing and financial strategies, link it to the stimulus and give reasons for it. But again, just don't be put off by the fact that it's in sentences. So the verb is recommend, the topic is financial management and marketing and we're looking at strategies there. All right, let's move on to our extended response type questions. So the only difference between the business report and the extended response is that obviously they're going to be topic uh, questions from different topics, but you have to use the case study. So in section three, if you don't write in report format, you're obviously going to be restricted in accessing the full range of marks. It's the same with the case study or extended response. No mention hint of a case study. You're really going to restrict being able to access more than, than a C range um, um, response. Okay, so just make sure that you're using case study. We need to then, if you're looking for high marks, you're gonna to have to integrate. So it's not just at the end of a sentence, oh yeah, example, Apple does this. That's not really, it mentions a case study, but it's not really an integration of the case study. The case study, you should refer to all the aspects of the syllabus in your preparation. Don't just use general company information. So don't just write about 
Qantas and when it was founded and etc. We're not really worried about that. We're worried about what aspect of Qantas do you know that's going to help you answer the question. And remember in this section, um, two topics. So one question on each topic and they will be different to what's in the report. So just to, I mean, just really must highlight that. You have to use case study and studies. Um, the next part I'll address is, students often say, do I use one detailed case study throughout or do I use multiple case studies? And the answer to that is you can do either. However, in recent years, students have been uh, using multiple studies and changing the case studies in the answer and it seems to give them a greater depth of understanding. So it's not like you're gonna get marked down for only using one or two or three, but definitely consider using multiple case studies. Okay, we haven't done much work on the rubric. Now the rubric is those sentences with bullet points above um, where the question lies. And we'll have a look at that a little bit later, but these are what you're gonna be assessed on. So knowledge relevant to the case study. So terminology, concepts, case study, logical, well-structured, answer the question. So if you've been um, you know, doing the work and doing the past papers, etc., this, and you understand the syllabus and you're really studying hard, you should be able to use the terminology using the case study and really getting that logical structured response. This is the 2019 um, questions and question 26 and 27. So obviously you answer one or the other. And we mentioned about in the planning time where you should look at the questions, review the questions and say, I think I'm gonna go with 26 and start planning that sort of answer in your head. They're both analyzed questions, so pretty high order verb, drawing out and relating the implications of or the relationship between market segmentation and the marketing strategies, okay? So this question is asking you to talk about segmentation and then what's the relationship with the marketing strategies there, okay? So if you look at an example like um, McDonald's and it's Happy Meal, they're segmenting the market, so they're targeting that younger children audience with, with the toy and, and with the actual meal. And then in the mark, the relationship is then McDonald's can um, target through its promotion to match up with that target market or that segmented part of the market, okay? The second question, very similar, except we've got performance objectives and the operation strategies. Okay, so I marked this question last year in the HSC. And again, it's the better students that actually, look down here, better responses, that clearly showed the relationship um, between the two points. Now I know this is on 26 and I'm looking at 27, but again, it's, it's the same feedback. Like, are you able to say what performance objectives are? Okay, so that's your, your KPIs and your, your cost and the speed, etc. And then how, do, does your app operation strategies, your outsourcing, quality management, et cetera, how does that relate to those strategies? So it's the relationship. So by doing this or achieving this, all right, you can put in place strategies to help you achieve those objectives. Okay. What else do we notice? Integrate the case study throughout, and this is it. This is, I guess, the major part. Draw out an implication. Okay, so it's not only just making the link between the two, but it's going that extra part and draw really going in depth and drawing out that relationship through good examples and case study, um, etc. Okay, so what did students need to improve on? And it's it's the reverse, isn't it? Drawing out the relationship. Um, using the terminology and having a clear understanding. So, you know, students who did not know what segmentation was and able to define it, well, you're really struggling to get any decent marks in this question. Um, if you're a student that just maybe knew what segmentation is, 
and give an example. Talked about a couple of strategies, okay? You're probably in that C range, that nine to 12 range. If you've made no connection, you're not going to get more than 13, okay? So the connection puts you into the 13, sorry, to the 14, um, 15, 16 range, that B range, and then obviously that drawing out significant implication and case study will put you into that A range. 2018 question. Explain the influence of global markets on financial management of businesses. Or question 27, explain the influence of globalization on the interaction of price and quality. So here, what we have is a finance question. Now, some students got confused when they see global markets, global marketing, they start thinking marketing, it's a finance part. So this part of the syllabus that you had to write on was around the availability of funds and the economic global economic outlook and interest rates. If you didn't know it, you're really gonna struggle in get, getting good marks at all in this question, okay? So students tend to get turned off by finance, not sure why. So they go to this question, it's a marketing question, but it's globalization on a specific aspect of marketing, which is price and quality. So um, speaking to students that, that did this question, they found it really difficult to get a detailed answer around that one concept, okay? And this one, again, there's three syllabus points you can write about to draw out an answer. So, you know, in the scheme of things, um, quite difficult questions there for your average business study student. Our better responses down here, again, integrates the case study, um, demonstrates an understanding of the global influences, so this is 26, um, and being able to look at the impact on the financial management, okay? Look at the criteria makes evident, clearly evident, the relationship between. So again, that connection, that link, and it's an explain question this year. So it's a lower mid order verb, that cause and effect, how and the why, but you still have to make a link. Uh, case study and this sustained logical terminology, etc. So really, really the only criteria that tends to change from year to year is the connection of the content. So this is, always a given and then it's the connection in the question that they're looking for. What I might do now is just jump ahead to look at the questions that have been asked in the past. All right, I'm just a bit conscious about the video going too long, um, but you all obviously can re-watch this and stop it and start it, etc. So what I've done is basically taken um, topic of operations and then listed down all the past HSE questions from 2012 onwards and put the year in brackets after it. So you can see operations has been um, the most tested in the last section. Now, I'm not sort of saying to you, let's start predicting and guessing what questions and topics they're going to be, um, you know, but looking at the past questions, we can get an idea of what has been asked and what hasn't been asked and that sort of helps with our preparation. So we've already been through question five, that relationship between the performance objectives and the strategies. 2017, analyze the effects of globalization on operations management. Now, this is a good one to point out. When it says operations management, typically it means the strategies. Could it mean the processes? Absolutely. But it's like, how does globalization, breaking down of barriers between countries and allowing access, greater access to markets, how does that affect operations? So in simple terms, globalization has allowed businesses like um, you know, Apple to set up its um, outsourcing component, Foxconn in China, and, and that's one effect. And then we look at the implications of economies of scale and producing quality phones and you know all around that cost saving etc have a look at this in question uh sorry question three in 2016 what do you notice here that these two questions one year after the other very similar evaluate the response of operations management to external influences so it's an operations question on management strategies 
to external influence. So globalization is our external influence. Okay. Now, if you've watched uh, video one with our uh, mnemonic about only in Greenland they quietly chew gum leaves every Christmas, that's um, the aspect or the influences on operations that they're looking at there. So is globalization external influence? Yes. The difference between the two years, however, is this, this is evaluating the response. So in other words, here's the influence external, uh, could be um, economic or it could be um, competitive based, etc. How has operations responded? So what strategies like a quality management in terms of uh, quality based, etc. Um, response to that. Whereas this year is the effect of globalization. So they're similar. It's almost like globalization has caused the business to respond by doing uh, these particular strategies. If we have a look then across the board, all five questions in some capacity are asking for strategies. So it's a given you need to know the strategies in each um, topic well. Assess the strategies to respond to the influence. Sounds pretty similar to 2016. Evaluate the importance of the strategies for competitive advantage. The responses of management, pretty much strategies to influences. The effect of globalization on management could be processes, but you know it's easier probably to do strategies. And then obviously this is a strategy on the strategies. Okay, so we're thinking about, let's move on to marketing. Um, marketing 2012, 14, 18 and 19 and last year, and we looked at last year's question already and we broke that down. Um, notice how, um, and we've looked at 2018, so we've got the price quality and the strategies there. Um, 2014, we've got strategies. So out of those four questions that were asked, three of them, are around strategies, some specific, some in general, and then we've got our ethical and government regulation. So, um, you know, this is looking at our consumer law, Australian consumer law, the Competition and Consumer Act 2010, and the ethical behaviour, things like truth and accuracy and good taste and um, engaging in fair competition, etc. So why? Why is that important? So that's looking at things like benefits and costs of, of that. All right, let's move on. Um, finance topic, as I said, students sort of don't really like too much case study questions and there's only been three of them. So this is the least tested operations has been the most tested and human resources and, and um, um, marketing uh, uh, similar in terms of the testing. Let's have a look 2012. How can different sources of funds help to achieve objectives? So again, it's a how question. Sources of funds. Okay, so where the funds come from and um, how they meet up with the objectives. Evaluate the importance of strategies, improving business performance. So what's business performance tends to come up a lot in questions. So performance could be what profit, could be sales, um, competitive advantage, market share. Um, so that's something to consider there. And then explain the influences of global markets on financial management. So again, we looked at that question and we talked about that um, interest rates, et cetera, and how that impacts upon the strategies of the business, the financial strategies. Okay, so looking at that, we would probably could, you know, and again, it's we're not into guessing here, but you know, it's it's 2012, 15, and 18 has been under tested in the case study. Okay, there's no guarantee that that'll come up this year. All right, and our HR topic, and we look through 13, 14, 16, 17 was the last time. What do we notice about the questions in general? Um, strategies responding to the influences sounds familiar doesn't it um, causes of disputes and the strategies to resolve them interesting part because you you know the hr topic is broken into um you know sort of that hr and looking after workers and then that whole dispute section so you expected to know a workplace dispute and how it's resolved 
And resolving doesn't need to just be the steps like the negotiation, etc. We can obviously use things like rewards, monetary and non-monetary rewards to, um, you know, to resolve disputes. In 2016, the response of management. So again, what's human management? Again, probably strategy. So how has HR management responded to these issues? So that's things like, you know, putting in place um, the processes there in around um, those influences legally in terms of uh, workers' comp and abiding by legislation and the ethical issues there. And then in 2017, again, this response of HR to these specific influences. So again, it's almost like they've doubled down here where they've got two very similar questions. Again, the response, evaluate, analyze, pretty high order. This is legal and ethical, but this is economic, technological and social. So looking at the other influences that weren't tested. All right, and, and they've, I've just left those questions in them. We've already sort of had a bit of a look at those. Um, this is the rubric I was talking about before. You know, a lot of students just ignore it, don't even read it. But, you know, if you've done enough practice and, you, and you've studied uh, well and you're well prepared, you, you should be doing that automatically. Um, and then I've got here, just to finish off, um, just wanted to show you this because um, in the last few years, what's happening is that students in section four are using report format and there's nothing wrong with report format. And some teachers are saying that they're teaching report format in both three and four, so students don't forget to do it in section three. Okay, but it's up to you. And again, um, it's a preference. Is it easier to answer the question? Sometimes, okay. Um, so you can use the headings and you can read the answer. It's quite a good uh, look at that question um, and the breakdown of it. And I've got in here some judgment. So things like effectively responded by doing this. Okay, uh, we've got our case study Jetstar and down here again, allowing Qantas to increase market share whilst decreasing costs enabling it to achieve a competitive advantage. So we've, we've got reasoning, we've got some judgment here, we've got case study, we've got <clears throat> sophistication in our answer, etc. All right, so that brings us to the end of the video. I know it sort of probably went on a little bit um, long there, um, but hopefully um, I've broken down the exam for you. You can go back and have a look at different sections again and um, Good luck with your study in the HSC um, and hopefully there's been some good advice that you've um, uh, received during the video. Good luck.